Welcome to the course, The Mathematics and Statistics of Infectious Disease Outbreaks. My name is Michael Höhle. I'm the second lecturer of this course, which is given together with uh, Tom Britton. Uh, the aim of the small introduction video is to give you a bit of introduction about the parts of the course, uh, which I'll be covering and also some of the technical background, which is necessary for you to complete the exercises and also for the project work. So for this, I will try to share screen. So hang on. Which we will have here. Okay. So uh, here are the first slides and I'll try screen mode not working like this so again here my name is Michael Höhle I have worked with infectious diseases for about 20 years I have a background in mathematics and computer science and after graduating I took a PhD in herd management which was about trying to control infectious disease outbreaks in pig production. And from then on, I've worked mostly with statistical methods. And also I have experience working three years for the German Robert Koch Institute, which corresponds to the German version of the Volkhelsemündigkeit. And I worked there from 2010 to 2013. And in 2013, I switched to Stockholm University, where I'm now partly affiliated, uh, but I spend most of my time living in Germany, where I'm a head of the biometrics unit of a federal institute uh, responsible for quality assurance in the healthcare sector, and in particular in hospital care. Uh, I'm currently also involved a bit in the COVID uh, response, and we will can talk more about that later. Maybe as a background, uh, when I came from computer science and started my PhD studies, uh, we were a couple of PhD students in the beginning uh, who, who were all working with uh, optimization methods, decision, decision support, and uh, health management in uh, pig production, and we wanted to get a bit more insights into the modeling of infectious diseases. So we found this uh, little gem here by Tom Britton and Håkon Andersson, Stochastic Epidemic Models and their Statistical Analysis. So this was more or less my first uh, experience with infectious disease modeling as part of my PhD studies. We took a PhD course, so it's a bit of an honor to also be able to now teach a course together with uh, Tom Britton. Um, so I'm very happy also to complement him with some of the skills maybe I can bring to the table uh, and which is also very much uh, in applied statistics, applied modeling and also fitting data to models uh, and so on. So maybe sort of a bit of a background here, modeling infectious diseases, we, we have not talked much about why we try to do that and why we what we are actually aiming for. But what has to be clear is that when we approach a real world phenomena with math, it's always gonna be abstraction. So what we model are gonna be mathematical abstractions, which uh, our language as mathematicians for representing such models is equations. But of course, models are always underlying assumptions. And uh, we should be very, humble at times about these assumptions because assumptions can be wrong and that will have a consequence. On the other hand, our job as mathematicians is to abstract and try to capture the important part in order to answer a question by uh, such uh, equations. So there will always be a trade-off between is a simple, is the model too simple for the problem or should something be added or is it not necessary to con consider this part? So, but again, we have not talked much about that. We will not have the opportunity to talk much about this in the course, but we should always be aware of that the models we use are abstractions of reality, which might not be correct for what the, is actually going on in, in real world. And that we should always try to remember. And also, and we already a bit touched upon that in the lecture by Thomas, 
that no outbreaks are going to be similar. So uh, stochasticity is gonna be something which is important. And this is also where the statistical part and statistical dimension also uh, comes in. How can we actually use these observations to fit data? I'll talk a bit about, more about that later. And then maybe sort of like, since we are now looking at mathematical modeling of infectious diseases, we should also be aware of that uh, infectious diseases can be of very different kinds. Uh, so far, we have more or less only talked about the person-to-person -person transmissible diseases. That means, uh, for example, influenza or like COVID-19, where one person infects uh, the other and the clear is the really the clear vector of transmission is the person-to-person -person one could also be uh, HIV is, is, is another example of this. Uh, and for example, uh, typical ways of spreading is for example, that, the, that it's airborne disease, uh, a droplet or aerosol transport. And that would, for example, be the case for probably the case for COVID-19. But there are other modes of transmission for other diseases, which are also important to know. For example, that diseases, infectious diseases are waterborne. That means there is, of course, a person-to-person -person transmissible component. Otherwise, we wouldn't call it infectious diseases. But maybe there is a, a, a component which makes more that the, 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 the difficult thing is um, in, in the water. And, and that is what is actually infecting. Also, for example, foodborne disease like salmonella um, is also uh, that it's, co it's a contaminated food product, which is actually, actually the problem. So there's actually very little uh, to none person-to-person -person, uh, transmission, but there's maybe a contaminated food product which is circulating and uh, which is causing problems. So that is something where these models, which we have talked about so far, like SIR models, is actually not may maybe the appropriate way to model this because the transmission part is, is different. And also there are other diseases like malaria, which are vector borne. That means there's a, not a mathematical vector, but there is a, a vector, a, a device, a, an other type of population which is needed in order to transmit. So for example, I think in malaria, it's such that you need a particular type of insect in order to uh, transmit disease from one individual to another individual. So there is it's not directly person to person, but you need this uh, CC, uh, insect in order to actually have the transmission. So it's important to understand a bit about the epidemiological background of the disease or the medical background of the disease that you're trying to actually model. And for what we'll mainly be talking about, have been talking about so far in lecture one is person to person transmitted disease, but be aware that there are other disease types which are interesting and also need to be studied. And we will talk a bit about that in some of the reporting mod modules, but I think our main aim and then what Tom is mainly talking about is these type of models, of course, uh, which are the ones where you really have the stochastic process component and also the lots of about population uh, information that you need to have in here. And again, also, and this is also something we have not talked about much so far, but Tom will talk more about that at a later stage, is that you have population heterogeneity. Not everybody is the same. You can have different places of res residence, so there's a spatial component. The contact behavior can be diff different between individuals. Even the susceptibility can be different. So all of this needs to be taken into account when needed for a particular problem. It's not, I mean, these things can always be relevant, but sometimes they are not so relevant for a particular problem. And you can take in a large scale context, that's not so important. So it's always important to balance what, how simple a model should be in order to be useful. And I mean, the famous saying is the model should be as simple as possible, but no simpler than that. And the other saying is all models are wrong, but some are useful. So it's always trying to, to move in this dimensions of uh, when is it appropriate for the problem. And we will not be able to, because that's really sometimes more about the applicational side of things. As mathematicians, that's not what we usually talk most about, but we should be aware of this when we try to analyze real world phenomena with data. So maybe sort of that was the mathematical side. I'll just talk a bit about the statistical challenge we will do here also 
talk a bit about in this course is that when we set up models and in particular statistical models, we need data or we want data in order to try to infer some of the parameters of the model or maybe to see if the model we are using is actually appropriate for what we try to analyze. So I'll, I'm, I'm gonna say this as a stochastic model and data and what we get or want is some parameter estimation or at least to try to improve our parameter estimation we can of course also take literature but what is for me always the most important part is the quantification of uncertainty which has to do of course this is maybe a large step and i realize that some of you have not studied uh, at a university level and statistical courses uh, not that many so we were trying to really to make this as approachable as possible and of course keeping in mind that this is something which also is, is, is a very statistical problem and even which is something which you could cover in a PhD or even in, in your active research. So we'll try to find the right level for all of this. And of course, and then when it comes to estimation, there are things which you will see will be difficult there because we, we've seen that we, we divide persons in from susceptible and then they, they turn infectious and then they become recovered. But actually when the time is when they actually got infected, that's something which in reality is very hard to observe because you don't know exactly when was it uh, that somebody inhaled that particular droplet which caused him to be, or her to become sick. So there's only partial observability for some of these events. You might have an idea, you can maybe narrow it down to a particular interval, but you can never say for sure when was it. There are instances where this is possible, but sometimes it's not. So how can we deal with that, that it's not possible to observe all of this? So this is something we at least will touch upon, but we will not go very deeply into this because this will uh, require very sophisticated statistical methods. And I think this, the, the aim of this course is also to be more of an appetizer uh, of the course for all of what you can do. And then of course, again, same as we say when we were try needed to be humble about the mathematical models we're using sometimes it's also good to be humble about the data which we will have available because even though it's data they might not reflect what we are actually interested in for example uh, they can seriously contain serious biases for example under reporting when we talk about COVID-19 not every uh, infected person will actually be recorded in some statistics. So when you download data from uh, John Hopkins University or you look at the Folkhälsa Mündeten page, it's only the confirmed or reported cases that we actually have and that's something else than those who are actually infected by the disease. And the, one of the big questions is how, how large is the ratio between the two how, and does it change over time? Of course, that depends very much on how do we actually test so of course, also what is the test behavior that might also be subject to change. So you can have a, a time series, which has some components related to the infectious disease dynamics. And that's what we're interested in, but it could simultaneously, simultaneously also contain very, very many other aspects, which we are not that interested in, but we have to deal with it because they are inherently part of the, the models uh, of, the, of the data that we, that we are trying to fit models on. So again, what my message is, uh, what we will provide you in this course are some techniques, some models, at a, some somewhat sort of like to get some ideas, to get some understanding on what are the challenges in infectious disease models. But I think the, the, the important message is that it, it's important to be humble when you approach a real world problem. And, and it's an interdisciplinary humbleness. humbleness. Uh, but of course we can try to inform some decisions and say what happens if uh, because we, it's, it's not feasible, it's not possible to wait and see uh, what will happen. We can, uh, because we know something about the structure of infectious disease outbreaks, can provide some information for that. So that will be uh, our, our main challenge for the course. So maybe a bit about the, the technical aspects of the course. And for that, I will uh, stop. Uh, I will take a new share. I will go to the, our course page which we have here. Um, so this is the method, our course webpage, which most of you are already familiar with. We have, our Tom already sketched some of the important information. We have additional literature, which could be good to look at. Uh, what I've added now is also a bit about the programming because we will, and in particular for my part, we will talk a bit about programming. Of course, you can use whatever programming uh, technique environment you're most familiar with but of course 
uh, we, or in particular I, use R, and what the code I will be providing will be in R code. So of course you have a bit more overhead if you use some other like MATLAB or uh, Python. But of course it's always a balance between how much overhead there is in trying to learn R compared to uh, using your own environment, which you are fami familiar with. So it's up to you how you want to do it. Maybe what I can say is if you want to use R and you're not familiar with that yet, uh, you need two things. You need, first of all, the R project for statistical computing, which is, is linked. And there you need to download the newest version of R for your computer. So there are binaries for, for, for all platforms available. And then you, we recommend you to use an IDE like RStudio which means IDE is an integrated desktop environment. So you can easily work uh, with the, your scripts and you can see your results and so on. Some other packages also like MATLAB or Python also have IDEs available to work with. Uh, so you could here uh, download uh, a version. And of course, we this is the free version which we, which we use here and important is, uh, the R project uh, is also an open source project, so there are, of course, no fees to use. And also the R Studio, at least in the free version, um, has no uh, budget restraints for you to use. Okay, so that will be needed. And I will, for example, then always also share uh, the code of exercises. So we would here, for example, be in our lecture two scripts, which is something which you can get from the homepage. So for example, here I've already put up the R code for lecture slide two. And so that is something which you can download in order to look at the slides. Uh, so there's the code which produced these slides will be underlying. So something like uh, the final size distribution of these plots here, uh, some of it will be available in these in this code here. And one of your jobs will be to sort of try sometimes to look at the code and try to extract uh, the parts which are necessary to create the figure. Uh, and maybe sometimes we'll say, have a look at this code and try to modify it such that it solves problem X and problem Y. So it will, it's good for you to know uh, R. I'm, for the moment, I've just put things here on a Moodle platform. Um, I'm thinking about whether it's worthwhile to try to put it on GitHub as well, which would also allow you to give comments and so on on the things we do. And that we will have to see how it develops. Again, GitHub then also requires you a registration. You need to know how it works and so on. So there's maybe not so much gain in that. Right. And for example, it's in our particular lecture too, I would, if that's possible for you, I would, uh, would be very interested in if you could fill out this questionnaire. Here, uh, so we get an, a bit of an idea of what type of participants we have. We tried to look, study some of it in LARNOC, but of course that's also maybe, maybe some of the information there is very complicated to get out. So we just tried to figure out sort of what's your study background, how many years of university level studies do you have, um, a bit about um, what your expectations are with the course. So I strongly encourage you to fill out this questionnaire before the lecture on Tuesday. And maybe I can comment a bit on that in the lecture. And some people already have filled it out. So I think there are about 25 people who filled out the questionnaire. In the Moodle system, we now currently have 140 people interested in the course. I guess there are some who have not filled out the questionnaire. And in particular, uh, I can already see that we have a very diverse set of students some second, third semester with the, the requirements of, of a mathematics course, but uh, I'm a bit unsure how much about the statistical parts because you already know because it's not part of the uh, required curriculum in order to be a, a, a allowed for the course, the way I at least understood it. And uh, of course, uh, statistics cannot be done without knowing a bit of statistics. Of course, I'm trying to, by what I put on the slides, try to give you a very uh, sort of helicopter view of what you need to know, uh, but of course a bit like what is a probability mass function, what is the Poisson distribution, that's stuff I would expect you to know already from school, uh, or at least that you've heard of it. And if it's 20 years ago that you may or may not have heard about if there's always Wikipedia to look up some of the terms. And of, please sort of try to understand that for us, it's very difficult to address this very versatile 
an heterogeneous student population, but of course we, we, we need to aim for what we put in the requirements, but of course also some of it you need to do by self-study. So I'm already, you will be frustrated at points, I'm afraid, because that's the way studying is, but I think you will be managed to uh, take out the important parts. And if there's something where you say, okay, this is way beyond what I know, I mean, use the discussion forum to uh, also ask for additional material or some guidance in which direction it, it can go. Again, for some of you, this may not apply. And for some of you, this, this might apply. Uh, again, we will, I will now with the other lecture, uh, as Tom, I go to make a video lectures for lecture slide two, but maybe sort of just as a background, um, I will always try a bit also to, to get some application part into it that you need to read something or that you should try to experiment. So the first one here is a blog post that I wrote um, about flattening the curve. I mean, this is, please note the date. Uh, so it was in the very, very early on in the outbreak. And there are some technical stuff which also relates to the stuff we're doing uh, by uh, in the lecture. So this relates very closely. And maybe sort of what is worthwhile for you to know is that always the, the post, you can read it and also get some ideas. Maybe also, it, I hope it motivates you to see that these things are actually useful, but you can also click here on the GitHub and then you have the uh, code available for these blog posts and you will recognize some of that, at least once you went through the lecture and the code for the lecture, you will recognize some things which are directly part of the lecture. And for example, for the for the first project I'm thinking about that you need to adapt some of this code here uh, to work uh, and solve some particular problems. So uh, have a look at these things as well. It will take some time, of course, and uh, but it, this is something which we will, of course, always then also return to in, in the project. Okay. Um, yes, for the more sort of organizational stuff. I mean, Tom already mentioned the most important part, maybe for you again, as a background, when Tom and I were asked if we were interested in giving such a course, end of March, we, we both immediately said, this is a good idea, but we were, we all knew that some of us were gonna be quite busy. But what we didn't know is that we probably also still in June will are quite busy with the outbreak. I mean, it was in some sense, maybe expected, but it wasn't so clear. So, of course, also this is an extra challenge uh, for for the both of us uh, to give this course to, while still being involved in some of the COVID activities, but you can see it from a positive side. That way we can always try to relate what we're seeing here to some very ongoing uh, stories, or ongoing discussions about COVID modeling. Um, so we'll try to get that bit into the course. And we already also planned here for the, the last uh, two lectures here that we will try to get a bit more in detail with the COVID uh, related things, but you will always, as you already heard from me now, uh, you will always hear that maybe we try to give some references to, to COVID modeling where possible. Um, yes, so without further ado, I think that's what I had to say here for the introductional part. I hope you will, your expectations will be fulfilled in the course. Um, it will be in some sense a not classical mathematical course because of course there are mathematical models, but it also has to uh, the applicational dimension. So we will read some papers, which I'm like uh, my blog post or uh, other articles which will not be completely mathematical in spirit, but, um, but should be readable. And of course, that also shows that the interaction between mathematics and the real world phenomena, which you're trying to model, that is an interdisciplinary approach. And it requires you also to sort of leave the universe of epsilon and alpha, and also to be able to sort of consider what are your data, what's the message that you're trying to transport when you do a modeling, how can you communicate your results? This is also something which is important uh, if your models should have any relevance. So we're trying to get that into uh, into the course as well. And we look very much forward to try and explain or share some of our experiences, but we're also very happy and we're interested and actually we encourage you to give also feedback because for me, this this, this is also an outstanding opportunity to have 
many, many students. We have at the moment at least between 100 and 150 students actively uh, participating in the course to get some feedback to, to go, how could you do this? And some of you have already maybe also an interest in, in modeling uh, some of this. Uh, so that will be also try to find channels, for example, the discussion forum to get feedback uh, back to us, ask questions. We encourage uh, you to do that uh, in order for also to have this interaction, which is a bit difficult. Now we're all in video lectures and I'm, for example, located in a different country. But uh, let's try and see that we get this to work. We look very much forward to it. And uh, with that, I invite you to have a look at the video for the uh, second lecture, which uh, will be online in a short time. Okay, thank you very much. And with that, I'm going to stop the recording of this. Like that. And here.